Speedrun of American trans history, any percent. Pre-colonialism, gender fluidity was common and openly embraced in many tribes, meaning individuals born male could take on female roles, and those born female could take on male roles. This extends to clothing, way of life, jobs, ceremonial duties, and what gender they wish to date. In fact, it was actually seen as good fortune for youth to be found as what we now call two-spirited. Two-spirited and transgender don't share exact definitions, but they do share a lot of parallels. Then a bunch of dicks arrived in boats and ruined everything. Yeah, there's really not too much to say about it. From there on out, everything just sucked. A laundry list of anti LGBTQ laws made harassment and brutality from the police a daily threat. Newspapers would even out LGBTQ members, causing lost friends, families, jobs, and even sometimes lives. Yeah, imagine waking up one day to see a picture on a newspaper only to find out that you've just been outed to the entire community of which is homophobic. Yeah, for many years, everybody was kind of lame, but that's not even as bad as it gets. A common term in court was the gay panic defense. Similarly, a trans panic defense was used as well. The argument behind this defense usually involved an LGBTQ individual making an advance on the potential murderer, and this would be enough to dismiss the case. However, the difficult to prove elements meant that in some scenarios, simply existing around the wrong person could end in you being assaulted and them being portrayed as the victim in court. All of this, routine police harassment, and even more anti-LGBTQ laws unlisted here sent a very clear message. We weren't welcome in the land of the supposed to be free, but soon everything would change. You see, even in the most repressed times, trans women and trans men existed in secrecy. As an example, there's incredible stories like Mary Jones, an African-American trans woman who lived most of her life as a female. She would sleep with rich men using a prosthetic vagina to steal their wallets. And if I sounded happy at that last part, it's because I am. I really like Mary Jones. She's my favorite, and for good reason. Grand larceny aside, in the 1800s, being both trans and African American would have been unimaginably difficult. She got arrested three times, two times for being a trans woman, and once for the whole grand larceny thing, which in this context is a very fun word. Mary Jones is truly the embodiment of saying fuck off to societal standards, and I love her for it. There are plenty of other stories that are absolutely incredible, including both trans women and trans men, but all of this brings me to one particular particular trans woman. In my eyes, she was an indirect factor that led up to the three riots I'll mention right after. So although the riots are seen as the turning point, I believe Christine played a huge role in their eventual occurrence. Christine Jorgensen was incredibly famous, an ex-World War II veteran who was the first known person to get a gender reassignment surgery. Her story swept across the nation like a fire. She even became a renowned actress and singer on top of this. But above all else, she was an activist advocating for trans rights nationwide. She gave representation, hope, and a voice to trans women at a time of horrendous repression. It's no wonder in my eyes that she became a social phenomenon in the 1950s and the riots happened not long after in the 1960s. I mean, today one more headline about one more celebrity feels inconsequential, but at that time when there was no LGBTQ representation and newspapers were finite, this was huge. Of course, there are many other factors that played into the eventual riots. The argument I'm trying to make here is her voice gave the voiceless masses hope. This representation and hope helping speed up the inevitable riots, which would have happened despite her role. My conjecture aside, However, as far as transgender history goes, she is an icon and a pillar. And all of this inevitably brings me to the riots. When hearing the term riots, think of it as retaliation. Riot is a term that was used to excuse police force, and these so-called riots only happened because of routine police harassment to begin with. In 1959, the Cooper Donuts riots started because of, as mentioned, severe and routine harassment from the police at a donut shop. Cooper's Donuts was a well-known LGBTQ hideout for the locals. It just so happened to share a neighborhood with a few gay bars. These venues were the only place openly LGBTQ members were allowed. Worse yet, bar owners could face legal consequences like losing their license for serving LGBTQ members. This led to routine raids and police presence. The night of the Cooper's Donuts riot, the police arrested five individuals. These five individuals were crammed into the back of one police car, and this was before any rioting or anything really illegal happening. All of this led to outrage from the other customers of the donut shop. This outrage sparked intrigue from the surrounding bars, leading to what we now know as as the Cooper's Donuts riot. By now, you may have asked yourself, Yuko, if it was at a donut shop, does that mean donuts were thrown at police? First of all, shame on you, this is a serious matter. Second of all, yes, and it is objectively funny. Now, I realize I'm on a timer, but I want to take just one second to appreciate this rendition of the night with you. I mean, just look at it. From the yum on the donuts building, to the police trying to eat the projectile donuts like it's a game of hungry, hungry hippos, to these donuts being flung like shurikens from the people in the roof. This is art. This second riot is seen as primarily a transgender community's victory. In 1960, the Compton's Cafeteria ride began because of whoa, wow, 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 wow. 
Routine police harassment. What a surprise. Targeted that night were a few trans women, one of which tossed coffee into an officer's face. At this point, other transgender individuals and LGBTQ members joined into the fray. One could say what started as a hurly-burly turned into a full-blown kerfuffle. But this next riot was no kerfuffle, for it was a full-on commotion lasting five days. These five days are seen as the tipping point for LGBTQ activism in America. And of course, these five days are the Stonewall Riot. The Stonewall Inn saw a flurry of arrests on the morning of June 28, 19. 1969. Inexcusable gender conforming laws saw 13 people ushered to police vehicles. One such victim whose head was struck by an officer called out to the crowd to act. And in this pivotal second, they did. The years of repression, horrendous murders, incarcerations, and overall treatment hit its tipping point. But Stonewall Inn was just ground zero, as the protests would last five to six days, and its mark on history would forever shift the lives of LGBTQ members nationwide. The impact of these nights should never be forgotten. And if you look around you today, this was far from the end, but the start of a long battle built on small wins. As much as some politicians want to ban LGBTQ knowledge, it's our duty to remember these nights. But that extends beyond the Stonewall Inn and the other riots for that matter. It extends to all the years of suffering and pain and loss. Because there are some people out there that I guarantee you would love to see nothing more than the 1960s again for us. Making us feel shame, trying to divide us, these are the tactics that they use. The spread of information and knowledge is our best defense in times where people feel hurt and lost. So I do invite you to do that, to at least try. Even if you change one person's mind, that can be enough. Like and subscribe if you want to support. There's a link to my Patreon down below if you want to go above and beyond. Any amount helps, and yeah, I appreciate you watching. I wish you the best. Okay, bye.